All right. Uh, welcome, uh, Professor Gerda Pujol. This is our fourth uh, lab and our next to last class. Let me see if I can get out of the screen share. Okay, great. Um, I am now um, um, here in Edinburgh, uh, uh, Scotland. Uh, but because of the uh, tremendous um, uh, news, you know, on Friday, President Trump, former President Trump was uh, indicted by the feds in what looks like a pretty uh, uh, strong case. So I'm I'm here, you know, in the United Kingdom. And this brings me back to um, January of 1649, when Charles I, King Charles I, was uh, um, put on trial for treason. And in fact, I just came from the... Um, uh, uh, Scottish National Portrait Gallery, and they have a, uh, um, a, a, a whole room devoted to the execution of Charles I, uh, which then led to the Stuarts and a Scottish dynasty until 1688. Um, and this was a, uh, uh, you know, uh, from his trial to his execution, 10 days later, Charles I uh, was beheaded 10 days later. Some other um, really remarkable examples of leaders being put on trial um, is the show trial of King Louis XVI in France in 1798 during the terror phase of the revolution. Um, in, his, in his case, he was put on trial and executed the same day. Um, um, uh, worse yet would be the case of the Russian Revolution, where the Tsar Alexander II wasn't even put on trial, just shot by, and his family, entire family, uh, shot by the Bolsheviks. Um, and so, um, you know, it's really quite remarkable when a, uh, you know, a former leader is, uh, uh, you know, tr um, uh, accused of uh, committing serious crimes. Uh, so we'll uh, take a look at that and we'll see, um, you know, uh, uh, the uh, Anglo-American common law tradition come into play. Now, before uh, we do that, let me do a recap because I've um, because of my travels, um, I have I, I've um, I put some uh, recordings of previous classes. So what I want to do is just bring everybody up to speed. Last time we had a live class was um, our lab number one, our module on the main sources of law. And you may recall we talked about federal law, um, state and local law, international law. And in the background is this idea of natural law and natural rights uh, in the background. Um, then, but we saw that for our legal environment, you know, we saw the main uh, uh, state and local, federal, and then international law. Then in our lab number two, which was a recorded class because of my travels, um, we talked about the common law. And you may recall that discussion post, um, one of the topics was Oliver Wendell Holmes. The life of the common law has not been logic it has been experienced. Perhaps the most famous quote about the common law. What's great about the common law is that it provides the background rules that apply to all business firms of all sizes. Um, rules about contract, uh, when a promise is legally enforceable, rules about property rights, and uh, when, for example, um, uh, can you own something that's never been owned? And um, lastly, rules about accidents and torts, unintentional and even intentional injuries. When is a person uh, or a business firm legally liable for somebody else's injuries? And there, um, the larger point I wanted to make that I want you to walk away from the common law is that the common law, whichever of these areas we're talking about, is a combination of bright line, simple rules, and also general flexible standards. For example, the general rule for legal liability for somebody else's injury is that a business firm, an individual, um, must take um, reasonable steps, reasonable precautions to avoid foreseeable injuries. That is the general rule of negligence, and it's a standard. Um, on the other hand, if you're involved in an abnormally dangerous activity, uh, for example, explos explosives or wild animals. Um, that is a strict liability rule where the owner of the animal, for example, or the person or business engaged in the you know, demolition or use of explosives is automatically legally liable for whatever injuries they cause, no matter how careful they were in handling the animal or in you know, um, preparing the demolition, et cetera. 
Uh, so um, that's the main thing about the common law providing these background rules. The other thing I wanted you to know about the common law is that it's generally, most of it is state law, state judge-made law. Some of it has been codified by state legislatures, uh, but you always have to consult an attorney licensed in the state in which uh, your inquiry on which your case is based or which the business is based, because there could be significant variations in the common law in some of the specific rules and standards that some of the courts uh, have adopted in a given state. But generally speaking, you know, I, I, uh, when I talked about the common law in our lab number two, I tried to talk at the highest level of generality where the rules are fairly similar in most places. For example, the idea of uh, a promise is not legally binding unless it's supported uh, by what's called bargained for consideration. An idea, by the way, that goes back to Oliver Wendell Holmes. Um, and this idea of bargained for consideration is that when you make a promise, you have to support it with something valuable. Uh, you have to put something on the table. A naked promise is not legally enforceable. Your promise has to be backed up by something of value, whether it be money, a service, something of that nature. Uh, as a general rule, um, same thing with torts and accidents, you know, uh, you're liable um, if you don't for somebody else's injury, if that injury is foreseeable and you didn't take reasonable steps to avoid the injury. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, the rule of first possession that we saw in Pearson v. Post, again, it's a rule that's been adopted in most places. Um, so just want to give you some idea of the common law. Lastly, though, one last cool thing about the common law is that you have it, you know, not just in England and the United States, but in really almost all English speaking countries have adopted, you know, where, where England used to have a colony, have adopted the common law. So India and Pakistan, um, Zimbabwe, Kenya. Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Australia, New Zealand, all of these countries are common law countries. And while there are important variations in some of the specific rules and standards of these places, um, they do we do share a common law heritage with these what are considered now Commonwealth countries. All right, then in the previous class, which was last week, which was also a, a pre-recorded lecture, as I was actually I was actually aboard a flight that that day, um, um, uh, we talked about the law of ideas. And the main thing there is that you can own an idea or the expression of an idea or uh, the distinct mark describing a product or service. Um, and the thing is, all products, all services, right, embody ideas. And um, patents and trade secrets are the traditional ways that you can own an idea. But also uh, with trademarks and copyrights, you can also own in, um, in when certain conditions are met, um, the expression of ideas um, or uh, the brand of a product or service. Um, and so uh, so there's four forms of intellectual property, four ways of owning a business firm or an entrepreneur can own an idea. And the reason why I devoted an entire module, an entire class to the law of ideas or to intellectual property is because this is really what separates successful firms uh, from firms that um, and firms that grow um, and firms that are successful, um, they own they develop, or in the case of Mark Zuckerberg, they've stolen valuable intellectual property, right? And then taken that property to offer products and services. Um, one of the things I wanted to note, though, with a case of Mark Zuckerberg, although we can say from a moral point of view, he probably stole the idea from the Winklevi, um, the idea of a, you know, uh, of a social network for Harvard, where you need a Harvard email address in order to join the network. Um, but legally speaking, right, um, in order to enforce your trade secrets, right, you have to take reasonable steps to keep your idea a secret. And this is why you always want to, you know, it's important, especially for startups, you know, always consult an attorney. OK, um, what will the courts in my state, because trade secret is pure common law, uh, what's generally required to protect an idea? Uh, what are courts going to require, uh, you know, uh, for me to prove to protect my idea?
um, uh, to give you one example. And so the, the, the case that the Winklevoss twins brought against Mark Zuckerberg is actually going to be a close one. In fact, that would lead me now to today's class, because today's class, our next to last class, which I am offering live, because I want to make some further comments about the indictment. In fact, I believe that when this class is over on Florida time, close to 3 p.m., uh, is when the formal arraignment is going to take place. I want to talk about criminal and um, civil cases. And so what I've done is I put in the chat the survey for today's class, and then I'll use those survey results as a way of then, you know, giving you um, the big picture of how civil and criminal cases are similar and how they are different. And what we're going to see, while it's very rare, you know, for a, a leader or former leader to be put on trial, you know, especially for treason, uh, which under the Espionage Act is the uh, uh, one of the, uh, 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 you know, uh, allegations here. Um, uh, we'll see, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll compare, you know, we'll have a benchmark to compare the way, you know, Trump is going to be treated by the legal system compared to some of these other leaders that we talked about, like Charles the first or Louis the 16th, um, or, you know, um, Alexander the second, you know, um, uh, but uh, let's begin. And, and the main thing I want you to let you know between a criminal and civil cases, the main difference is going to be, um, it, it's actually an interesting philosophical question. Why do we have two different types of cases, civil and criminal, right? The penalties are different. This will be the first survey question. Um, let's jump into the survey and then look and then uh, and then we'll take it from there. So I'm going to do a screen share. I believe I have the survey up. Um, great. And I did play some theme music at the beginning as I was getting set up over here. Um, it's a shame that uh, with the light, with the glare, you could see the castle in the background, but the, the glare is just uh, not allowing me to, uh, to show you the castle. Uh, but anyways, um, I played some Mariah Carey as this was a popular song when Eduardo and Mark Zuckerberg go to court. We'll talk about their case as well. We'll go back to the social network um, and um, we'll say more about that. But I think I have the survey pulled up over here. Um, oh, these are the modules. So before I begin the survey, just want to show you, um, you know, put an example of a state case based on the movie JFK by Oliver Stone, only because about 13, almost 15 percent, more than 10 percent of the class, you know, would have liked me to say more things about JFK, uh, the movie. So I'll talk a little bit about that. The only, you know, the government um, appointed, President Johnson appointed a commission to investigate the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. This is the so-called Warren Commission. And the Warren Commission, because it was the, 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 um, the, uh, the, the leader of the commission was, at the time, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Earl Warren. Um, the commission concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald had acted alone. Um, however, um, you know, people continue to believe, uh, myself among them, you know, that uh, the lone gunman theory, um, you know, is kind of incredible, hard to believe that there was perhaps a conspiracy uh, to assassinate the president. But I will tell you, the only case to allege a conspiracy in the assassination of President John F. Kennedy, that is the case that is depicted in the movie JFK. It was brought by um, this uh, a, a remarkable character. Uh, the district attorney for New Orleans at the time. Um, uh, gosh, I'm, I, his first name is Jim. I'm now blanking out on his last name, but he's played very memorably by Kevin Costner. And um, and this case was called uh, Shaw uh, or the state of Louisiana versus Clay Shaw. And uh, Shaw was ultimately acquitted of the of the accusation of being involved in a criminal conspiracy. Uh, he was accused of financing the conspiracy. Um, uh, part of it, though, what's interesting about the movie is a lot of the DA's witnesses um, did die under mysterious circumstances, which also have you know fueled the, the fire. You know what I mean? Um, of whether there was a conspiracy or not. You know, was it a coincidence that all of these witnesses? Uh, you know, died and never got to testify about the conspiracy or, you know, was that not a coincidence? And so, uh, you know, I just throw that out there as an example of a criminal case uh, alleging conspiracy. In your discussion post for this week, I'm going to ask you to tell me, do you think uh, websites like Chegg and Quizlets, to the extent that they, you know, uh, provide a platform uh, that uh, allow users to cheat could that be considered a criminal conspiracy? I mean, how broadly do we define conspiracy? One of the charges against President Trump is, in fact, 
conspiracy to obstruct justice. So conspiracy is generally a broad charge. I'm just going to tell you right now, uh, to prove a conspiracy, you only need two requirements. The crime doesn't have to be committed. What you need is an agreement between two or more people to commit a crime and what the law calls an overt act. You have to take at least one concrete step to commit the crime, even if the crime is never committed. So the classic example of this would be, for example, if we agree to rob a bank or we agree to rob a Brinks truck, right? That would be a consp criminal conspiracy if we take a step in that direction. So if, for example, I buy maybe a ski mask and some gloves, you know, and, uh, you know, get a, a steal a getaway car, you know, in order to, even if we decide to bail out of the conspiracy and not rob the bank, not rob the Brinks truck, we could still be accused of a conspiracy. So if I'm, for example, President Trump, I'm going to be very worried about this, uh, uh, these criminal charges, because um, even if I can prove my innocence, you know, that, uh, you know, even if let's assume the best case scenario, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, if I conspired, you know, uh, with someone to break the law and an overt act, I don't have to be the one to take the overt act. Any member of the conspiracy, if they take the overt act, you know, then everyone in the conspiracy could be found guilty. So that's a very, uh, you know, very, very uh, dangerous. You know, when you're charged with conspiracy, you know, it really is an uphill legal battle for the defendant. Uh, the other examples I have, I do have some examples of federal cases here, criminal cases. The one I would have talked about is the case of United States versus Swartz. I kept it in there. That is a case very similar to the face mash. There was a student at Harvard who actually illegally accessed some information and posted it on the internet. Um, and he was accused of violating, you know, breaking the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. Um, one difference between the case of Aaron Swartz and Mark Zuckerberg is that Mark Zuckerberg, his site was taken down quickly. And Aaron Swartz, you know, um, he is a self-defined hacktivist. And so, um, you know, he purposely kept his website up. Um, and his website involved uh, proprietary, you know, uh, research. And so, um, uh, you know, but a lot of people thought there was a double standard uh, because um, the thing, thing is, the research that Mr. Swartz had posted on the internet that he had illegally hacked um, was research that was by and large funded by the National Science Foundation, which is basically taxpayer money. And so his, his point was, if the taxpayers are funding the scientific research, then you should have a right to access the research for free not have to pay for it. You know what I mean? And so um, um, what now was tragic about the case is that Swartz ended up committing suicide while he was awaiting trial. And so the case, you know, was ultimately dismissed against him. Um, and then I've included uh, the, the Donald Trump indictment, which I'll say a few more things about when we get to the survey. Um, I have an example of a federal civil case. So civil versus criminal, right? Civil, you're normally suing for money. You know what I mean? The criminal case, you know, you're looking at a potential, you know, um, you know, and the worst case scenario, an imprisonment penalty. You know what I mean? Um, and so um, here, the Winklevoss twins do the movie does get this right. And I've included here a copy of their original complaint. Now, one of the things that's really unique about that original complaint that the Winklevoss twins filed or brought against Zuckerberg was that it only alleges common law claims, and yet they bring, which is state law, and yet they bring it in federal court. So we'll talk about that in today's survey results. And finally, I do want to talk about the case with Eduardo, you know, and um, Mark Zuckerberg. In a way, Eduardo feels betrayed, you know, it's like the song, We Belong Together, you know what I mean, by Mariah Carey. Hey, you know, I helped you co-found the company, and here you are diluting me from the company. And so um, uh, uh, reducing my ownership, you know, from a significant, you know, one third to a very small, uh, you know, less than, you know, 0.03%, as they say in the movie. So we'll talk about that. That was a state case. So let's, without further ado, um, Joanne, I just want to let you know what's in the, uh, what's in the, um, you know, what's in the module. And then if you haven't done so, here's another link to the graded survey for, for this week, for this class. Um, the final project, I've reposted it here. Um, ideally, you want two to three, I'll allow up to four. 
Um, and I'll, you know, if time permits, I'll say a few more things at the end. But let's go, let's cover today's uh, let's cover today's class, and let's go then since we're in the screen share modality, let's go to survey statistics. All right. Now, what is the main difference between a civil case and a criminal case? And you can see here. Let me see if I can make this any larger. Um, it kind of gets distorted if I do that. Um, you can see here that I've, um, I'm going to end the class by talking more about the commonalities, but you can see these are some of the main difference. This is going to be one of those questions where it's all of the above. Um, so, you know, the burden of proof, which is going to be the most important aspect of our legal system, of our ideal of due process, the burden of proof. One of the things that both civil and criminal cases, now it's true, the burden of proof is different. If it's a criminal case, it's proof beyond a reasonable doubt. If it's a civil case, we'll see it's a lower burden of proof. I'll talk about that at the very end. Um, but the main thing is that the what, what civil and criminal have in common is the burden of proof is always on the moving party. If it's a criminal case, it's on the U.S. attorney if it's federal. It's on the prosecution, state attorney if it's a state case. If it's a civil case, the burden of proof is on the plaintiff, the party that brings the case. So that's a, a one important you know, commonality. Although the burdens of proof are different, the burden is always on the party making the accusation. The guy or girl saying, the other guy did something wrong, you know? Um, I'm the victim here. I want compensation, you know, or the or the state coming in, you know, we're going to bring criminal charges. The person who brings the case has the burden of proof as a general rule. I say as a general rule, because if you have a defense, then you have the burden to prove the defense, uh, you know, your defense. But in terms of proving you guilty, whether it's of a civil, a case of a civil nature, common law, or of a criminal nature, state or federal, it's always on the plaintiff or the prosecution on the moving party. That's an important commonality. Now, another difference is that you know criminal cases are prosecuted by public officials, whereas civil cases are generally brought by private parties. But the government can bring a private case, you know, a private civil case if it's maybe involving a government contract, for example. Um, and uh, you know, a private person can press charges. But it's always up to the district attorney, but uh, you know whether to bring whether to bring the case or not, or the U.S. attorney if it's a federal case. But one of the things uh, that both um, you know civil and criminal cases have in common is that the moving party doesn't have to bring the case, right? We already saw with Face Mash why Mark Zuckerberg wasn't prosecuted for the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act or under state law or sued under the common law invasion of privacy is because. First of all, you may not have a strong case. You know what I mean? But second of all, even if you have a strong case, you're not compelled to sue. You know, same thing with the prosecution. They have discretion, prosecutorial discretion. Even if, you know, they think someone is guilty um, or has committed a crime and there's evidence to back it up, the prosecution has discretion which cases to bring. Then finally, um, what is the most common remedy here? Yes, civil and criminal cases look a lot different, you know, in a civil case, the remedy usually is, you know, compensation, money damages. In a criminal case, right, the penalty is going to be you go to jail, but that's not always true. Sometimes in a criminal case, the penalty is you have to pay a fine, you know. Now, granted, the fine goes to the government, right, um, whereas in a civil case, if you have to pay money damages, it goes to the plaintiff, you know, it goes to the party who brought the case. Uh, but sometimes, you know, a criminal case can involve, you know, payment of money in the form of a fine. And civil cases sometimes, although um, rarely do they involve imprisonment, but, you know, um, the judge in a both civil and criminal case does have what's called a contempt of court power. So if you disobey the judge's instructions, even in a civil case, you could be, you know, the judge has discretion to put you in jail. Doesn't have to do it, but the judge has discretion to put you in jail if the parties disobey the judge's orders. For example, you know, like decorum in the courtroom. You know, if you shout out, you know, I'm innocent, I'm innocent, you know, or, you know, F you, your honor, you know, the judge can throw you to jail for breaking his rule or her rules of decorum. All right, so um, there are differences, there are commonalities, but there's, the main thing here is I want to show you that there's, 
two main types of legal liability and there are two main types of cases. Now, the way this cashes out in law school is that civil cases have their own rules of procedure and criminal cases have their own separate rules of procedure. Like for example, today on Friday, Donald Trump was, President Trump was indicted, you know, accused of among other things, you know, treason by breaking the Espionage Act. Today, he'll be arraigned, he'll be formally charged. Um, and then uh, the judge um, generally will hold a probable cause hearing, you know, is there enough evidence that there's probable cause that the crime was committed? And then finally, there'll be a trial and potentially an appeal. You know, um, in civil cases, it's a lot different. Civil cases, it's a three act play. First, you have what's called the pleadings. The plaintiff brings a complaint and the defendant gets to answer the complaint. Then you have the discovery process. And by the way, this is what I love about the movie, The Social Network. If you look at the movie, it's going back and forth in time. The de deposition testimony during the discovery phase of the Winkle, uh, I'm sorry, during the discovery phase of the Winkle Voss case and the Eduardo case, right? And then the deposition testimony reconstructing what happened at Harvard and what happened in California when Facebook was founded, right? So deposition testimony, deposition is the main form of discovery. Before a case goes to court, the attorneys for each side may call any individual whether they're named in the complaint or not, um, they may compel them to provide testimony in the case. Um, and if the witness doesn't want to, you know, doesn't want to testify via deposition, then the attorney can go to a judge and get what's called a subpoena to compel the witness to testify at the deposition. And if the witness does not show up to the deposition, the judge has the power, that's contempt of court, to imprison, you know, the uh, the deponent until he or she testifies. Deposition testimony. The idea is before a case goes to trial, apologize, there's some an ambulance over here. Um, before a case goes to trial, um, the depositions of all the witnesses um, and the federal rules of civil procedure, which have been copied by most of the states, any witness that has information relevant to the case or likely to lead to the production of relevant evidence in the case may be called to give their testimony in a case via deposition. And then that deposition can be introduced in at trial as evidence, actual evidence to prove either the truth of the allegations in the complaint, remember we're talking about civil cases here, or to prove the defendants, maybe they have an affirmative defense, you know? Um, and then finally, um, you know, with the civil cases, you have the pleadings, you have discovery, and then finally is when you have the trial and then potentially an appeal. You know, the trial is the last thing. And in fact, it turns out most federal and civil cases, you know, I'm sorry, most federal, state, civil, and criminal cases, most are usually either dismissed or settled out of court. And so only actually very few cases do end up going to trial. Uh, we'll see why uh, later, a little bit later on. So I just wanted to, uh, here I just wanted to highlight what are some of the main differences between civil and criminal cases, but also some similarities. Okay, now let's talk specifically about uh, about uh, the Trump case here. And um, you can see here what I wanted to teach you here is that uh, the federal court system, it's sim you know, it's generally follows the map of the 50 states. The federal court system is, you can see on this map, is divided into um, 12, if you include the District of Columbia, geographical circuits. And these circuits encompass two or more states. Um, now, within uh, these circuits, you have federal district courts within each state. Each state of the United States has at least one federal district court. If I can zoom in here without distorting the image, um, Florida, for example, yeah, you see it, it gets smaller, unfortunately. Um, it, it's a little bit hard to see on, you know, uh, here, but Florida, what you're gonna see here has a Southern district, there's a Southern Trial District Court in Miami. There's a Middle District, and there's actually two courthouses, one in Tampa, two federal courthouses, one in Tampa, one in Orlando, and there is a Northern District, and the Northern District is in Pensacola, the trial court. But you'll notice Florida 
is grouped here with Alabama and Georgia, and there's the number 11, that's the 11th circuit. So if you have a federal court that goes to trial, you know, a federal case that goes civil or criminal that goes to trial in Florida, in Georgia, or in Alabama, and then one of the parties wants to take an appeal, they're going to go to Atlanta, where the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals is. And then uh, after that appeal, if one of the parties wants to go up to the Supreme Court of the United States in Washington, D.C., that would be the final appeal. But here's what I want you to know about the federal, and this is generally true in all the state courts as well. The main difference between a federal court system and the state court system is that you see in Florida, we just have three federal district courts or three federal districts, right? But Florida has 67 counties and each of our Florida counties has its own courthouse, right? Same thing with Massachusetts here you know, where Zuckerberg, the face mash incident and the founding of Facebook, Massachusetts only has one district court for the entire state, the district court in Boston. That's where the college admissions bribery scandal criminal case was brought. Um, and, um, uh, but Massachusetts has something like, I believe, 42 counties and each county has its own court house as well. So that's the main difference. That's the main difference. Um, uh, so uh, here, what I'm asking you in this case is, you know, uh, it's all in the news what all the allegations are. Trump is accused of making a false statement. Trump is accused of conspiracy to obstruct justice, you know, um, and withholding documents, you know, during the investigation, you know, late leading to the police raid of his private residence. And finally, you know, Trump is accused, most importantly, of uh, violating the espionage act. Now, I just want to throw it out there. My opinion is if you actually look at the history of the Espionage Act, you know, what I see there are cases usually brought, you know, for politically motivated reasons. You know, um, the first time the Espionage Act was used to prosecute people, uh, it was used to prosecute socialists and communists for their opposition to World War I. Um, and then basically the history of the Espionage Act, you know, as I've studied it, has been, you know, um, you know, has been, I will say, questionable at best. Uh, but, you know, you read the indictment. So what I want to, uh, you know, it looks like a pretty strong indictment. You know what I mean? Um, so I want to ask you, you know, where would Trump have the best chances of being found not guilty? Or you could ask the reverse. Where does the government have the best chance of, you know, winning its case? And so here's the thing. When it comes to a criminal case, here's one important difference between criminal and civil federal cases. When it comes to a federal criminal case, the case has to be brought in the district in which the crime occurred, you know? And if it occurred on the high seas or in a, you know, outside one of the 50 states or one of the federal districts, um, then Congress has to decide which court. Um, and so, um, in the case of the documents with uh, President Trump, right, the documents were taken, um, I believe, mostly from the White House, so it's in Washington, D.C., right, but they were transferred to Mar-a-Lago, which is located in the Southern District. So this is where the class thinks, where does Trump have the best chance of winning? And notice, by far, Miami. And here, I agree with the class 100%. You know, Trump actually, if I'm not mistaken, won, and so did DeSantis, right? They won Miami, right? They won Southern Florida, which historically has been a, you know, heavily, uh, uh, like a Democrat, you know, uh, district, you know what I mean? Um, but, you know, Trump, and, uh, and, you know, and, and more recently, DeSantis, surprisingly, you know, for a lot of political pundits, won a uh, Southern Florida, you know, uh, more votes there um, um, or more votes than expected. But in District of Columbia, New York City, for example, uh, you know, Trump, you know, lost, you know, I mean, it was not even close, right? Like 10 to one. You know, for every vote Trump got, uh, Joe Biden got 10 votes, you know what I mean? Or whoever the Democrat was, you know, Hillary Clinton kind of thing. So um, notice this case, if you look at the indictment, it was brought in Miami, however. Personally, I think that's a major strategic blunder that the prosecution made. You know, the prosecution could have brought the case in Washington, D.C. Um, and by bringing, you know, because you could say the crime was committed there. You know what I mean? When the documents were removed. You know what I mean? Uh, but um, so we'll see how that plays out. You know, we'll see if that may has any difference. But that's the way lawyers look at a case. Now, what's the difference between um, uh, federal criminal jurisdiction, where, as you see in the Constitution, right? 
the case has to be brought in the district in which the crime was committed or alleged to have been committed. And civil jurisdiction, civil cases like the Winklevoss twins. You'll notice, for example, I've included the Winklevoss complaint in the module. You can see it for yourself. The Winklevoss sue Mark, the Winklevi as, you know, plural, they sue Mark Zuckerberg in Boston, federal court in Boston, you know? And um, um, uh, and the thing there in um, uh, federal cases, the test is going to be called minimum contacts test. There's something you learn in law school. I'm not going to ask you about it here, but I just want you to let you know that for civil cases, as long as you have any connection in which the state, uh, in the state, uh, uh, in the state of which you're being sued, you can be sued in that state. So Zuckerberg. Since he, although now, you know, he, you know, you know, when he's finally sued in September of 2004, right, he's dropped out of Harvard, he's out in California, Silicon Valley, right, basically, you know, no intention to go back to, uh, to, to Harvard, right, but, but because the facts of the case occurred, you know, in Harvard, right, because that's when Zuckerberg met the Winklevi twin after the face mash incident, that's where he allegedly stole their idea, right, that's where he made the promise to help them with their website and broke the promise, you know? So um, there is a minimum contact connection with, you know, Zuckerberg and the state of Massachusetts. Zuckerberg could be sued in Massachusetts. This is why, and let me show you something right now. Let's go to Facebook's terms of use, but this is going to be the same. Um, uh, this is going to be the same in, um, you know, for Instagram and, and Snap and, uh, you know, TikTok. Uh, but let me just show you Facebook as we're talking about the social network, uh, social network, uh, terms of service, terms of use. This is the contract, right, that you have to agree uh, if you want to use Facebook. So I'm in the screen share here. And almost all business firms, right, that are represented by a lawyer, what they're going to do in their contracts, in this case, the contract is the term of service, right? You as a user have to click I agree before you can sign into Instagram or Facebook or whatever, right? What you're going to see here is basically a form that nobody is going to read. You know what I mean? Maybe a few experts are going to read it and then post on their website, but the general public is not going to read this. But if you go to um, part four of the contract of the terms of service, terms of use, and you look at um, specifically here um, disputes, and let's, let me see if I can make this larger so it's a little bit more visible on the screen share. Um, what you're going to see is what lawyers call a forum selection clause. Like Zuckerberg does not want to ever get sued again in Massachusetts if his company is located in California, right? And so what you see here, now it's called Meta, of course. So they changed it to Meta. But what you see here is that if you have any dispute with Meta, you're going to have to sue them in California. And let me just say right now, uh, end the screen share to emphasize this point. This is a huge, huge deal because now basically all of or almost all of the litigation Facebook is involved in with its users, with its user base. And remember, Facebook, right? It's the first giant social media company, billions of users, you know. Um, um, you know, now if they want to sue Facebook, it's got to be in California. So basically, Facebook, right? They have their own lawyers, they have their own law firms, right? If it's a state case, it's going to be brought in the Northern District. Uh, I'm sorry, if it's a federal case, it'll be brought in the Northern District of California. There's a courthouse in San Jose, very close to Palo Alto or Menlo Park, where uh, uh, Facebook is currently, Meta is currently located. And if it's a fed, if it's a state case, right, I believe that's San Mateo County, right? Um, it'll be brought in the local courthouse for the county in which Facebook is lo headquarters are located. What that means is that, think about it, right? Your Facebook's lawyers, right? You're basically dealing with the same judges, both state and federal, every time Facebook is being sued. So you know you have sort of the inside baseball of how those judges, you know, which judges are pro are pro business or pro Facebook, which judges are pro consumer or pro, you know, the little guy, you know, and then you can adjust your case, you know, your strategy accordingly. You, you know what I mean? Because Facebook basically. All of their cases, or most of them, are going to be heard by these two courthouses, you know, the state courthouse in, in San Mateo County and the federal district court for the northern district, which happens to be just a few miles away in San Jose. All right. So um, uh, so that's what companies do to protect themselves from being sued out of state, you know. 
Um, if you're doing business in any one of the 50 states, right, you're going to be considered as having minimum contacts in that state, and you could be sued in that state. But if you have a contract with your customers, with your fellow business suppliers, with your user base, if you're an internet company, right, and that contract contains a forum selection clause, courts have said, look, as long as the clause is reasonable, we're going to enforce it. If the clause says you have to, you can sue the company, but you have to sue them in California, we're going to enforce it because Facebook is located in California. That's a reasonable clause. Okay, so let's continue then with our survey results. Um, let me just go back to the screen share. And I believe the survey was right here. Um, so you can see here, by the way, if you go into the actual Trump indictment, you'll see that it was brought in Miami. Um, and uh, that's where the raid occurred. That's where apparently, um, you know, the idea here is to avoid a protracted fight over where the whether the District of Columbia has jurisdiction, where where were the Trump alleged crimes committed? You know, by bringing the case in Florida, you know, where the documents were retained, you know what I mean? Then there's really, you know, there's no there's no doubt that the Miami, the Southern District, I should say, you know, the district court for the Southern District of Florida, which is in Miami, will have jurisdiction. Um, all right. So um, next thing, let's talk about Eduardo. By the way, there's a great scene in the movie, one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Let me just go to the modules to show you the scene because it's actually based on um, uh, true events. And uh, let's go to the module and I'll play the scene for you because it is a powerful scene. I'll play the first part of the scene. Um, this is called the denouement. This is when this is when Eduardo realizes he's been betrayed by his best friend. Now we're going to have an ad, so let's go ahead and mute that. And um, when I skip it, I'll say a few more introductory remarks. This is what the really this whole movie is about. Um, let's see. I thought I skipped the ad. Here we go. Now, this did happen. Um, it didn't exactly happen when Facebook was celebrating the party for their million users, but it did happen shortly thereafter. I want to give you a little bit of background. You have to understand that um, uh, that someone is going to have to get diluted, you know, because um, in May of 2005, literally, uh, you know, just one year and two months after the Facebook was launched, you know, now it's called Facebook. Um, this company of um, a venture capital company called Excel Partners, they're going to invest $13.9 million. Um, and that's going to give uh, uh, $13.9 million in Facebook, in Zuckerberg. And that's going to give uh, the, the, the Facebook uh, a a like, um, you know, 500 million, some, a crazy valuation for a company that's just a little bit than a year old. Um, so Eduardo is going to be diluted in order that, you know, Excel partners can come in. Eduardo realizes this. And this is what happens according to the social network. Now, what I'm about to tell you is what really happened. And what really happened is going to be 10 times more dramatic than what you're going to see in the movie. And this is pretty dramatic. Hold on here. Let me see. Uh, let me get, put the sound back on. Wired in. Sorry, he's wired in. Is he? Yes. About now, you're still wired in. You wish for 24 million new shares of stock. You were told that if new investors came How much were your shares diluted? How much were his? What was Mr. Zuckerberg's ownership share diluted down to? It wasn't. What was Mr. Moskowitz's ownership share diluted down to? It wasn't. What was Sean Parker's ownership share diluted down to? It wasn't. What was Peter Thiel's ownership share diluted down to? It wasn't. And what was your ownership share diluted down to? 0.03%. You signed the papers. You said, yeah, you're going to blame me because you were the business head of the company and you made a bad business deal with your own companies. By the way, this is 
very common mistake, right? Eduardo had, if you recall the movie, this is correct. When Peter Thiel says, look, Zuckerberg, I'm giving you $500 million. And I, as I explained in one of my recorded videos, it was actually a loan. It wasn't an investment. It was, I'm giving you this money. You won't have to pay me back if you get a, hundred, you know, a million members by the end of the year. Um, but all I want is a right of first refusal to bring in Excel partners and bring in, you know, uh, myself, my, 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 um, I think his thing was called Clarion Capital back then as well. And um, when Eduardo did, and, and, and but then um, Peter Thiel says, we're going to restructure your limited liability company from Florida as a Delaware corporation. Now I'll say more about corporate governance in our last class. And, you know, I want to talk about business ethics and, you know, governance is the making of decisions. Uh, so I, I'm going to save that for our last class next week. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do another live Zoom. Um, but uh, what I want to let you know is that when Eduardo signed those papers, right, the lawyers right, who drafted those papers, right, those weren't Eduardo's lawyers. Those were Facebook's lawyers, right? And, um, you know, Eduardo really... Uh, made a big mistake there when he signed those papers without um, having independent review, right? You know, his own independent legal review, thinking that Facebook's lawyers were representing him when they were representing the interest of the company. Now, I, I, want, you, I want you to ask yourself this. Why was Eduardo, he, he had already signed the papers authorizing Zuckerberg and the board of directors to dilute anyone if new business partners like Excel Partners comes in you know, new equity investment, the series A investment, you know, and generally there's like a five series, you know, before a company can go public. And so, um, uh, you know, why bring Eduardo back in if he's already signed the papers? Well, that's what I'm about to tell you. That's what the movie doesn't tell you. But um, the rest of the scene is really, really good. I'm going to skip the part about the chicken and just show you my favorite part of the scene. <laughs> Flip-flops, you pretend to Security is very I'm not signing those papers. We don't get the signature. Tell me this isn't about me getting into the Phoenix. Why did that story be about the chicken? What the story about the chicken? What's he talking about? The accused of animal cruelty. Seriously, what the hell's the chicken? And I'll bet what you hated the most is that they identified me as a co-founder of Facebook, which I am. You better lawyer up, asshole, because I'm not coming back for 30%. I'm coming back. Now, that is an incredibly powerful scene. So ask yourself, right? You're Eduardo. You are. This did happen. He was brought back. Um, where should he bring his case? Um, um, one of the things is that you may not know. Let's see what the class thinks here. Um, well, this is what the movie is not showing you. The reason why Eduardo was actually invited back you know, to sign and ratify what he had already agreed to. Because Zuckerberg knows he's not going to agree to that once he realizes what's going on. You know, think about it. Put yourself put yourself in a moment in Eduardo's position, right? Um, you know, I think it was reasonable for him to assume that, you know, of course, you know, we're going to have to dilute our ownership stake to bring in new equity and that, you know, the Series A investment, you know, the XL partners. But he probably thought that everybody was going to be diluted at, at a proportional basis, you know, fair. But Eduardo is the one who singled out nobody else. Dustin Moskovitz, Peter Thiel, uh, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Chris Hughes, you know, none of the other founders, Sean Parker, nobody else is diluted. Right. And so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Eduardo genuinely feels that this is really unfair. I really feel kind of bad for him, you know, but the reason, and this is what the movie doesn't tell you the reason, and it's in my module. The reason why Eduardo was invited back was because once he refused to sign the papers ratifying what had happened, um, he was served with legal papers. In fact, it was Zuckerberg who sued Eduardo first. Why? Because Edu uh, Zuckerberg, his lawyers wanted to make sure that this lawsuit, they know, of course, Eduardo's going to come and sue them eventually, right? But think about it, if you're Eduardo, what jury is going to be more favorable? The class got it right on Trump, right? Probably a Southern Florida jury, especially if it's an immigrant jury 
a jury that may be aware, you know, uh, uh, may be pro-Trump, may have voted for Trump, may be sympathetic for Trump, you know? Now, of course, there'll be a war dire. The judge will try to be neutral, right? But you're going to have to find, you know, people who are serve on juries are people who are registered to vote, you know? That's generally how it is. Now, in the state, you may not necessarily be registered to vote as long as you have a driver's license. You could be eligible uh, uh, to uh, to serve on a jury. But I'm going to tell you, I, I'm going to tell you the federal, you know, the way the federal juries work is you have to be registered to vote and live in the district in which you're going to be called. And so, yeah, you know, um, you know, Trump is probably going to get a sympathetic jury. Now, imagine you're Eduardo. What jury do you prefer? A jury in California? or a jury in South Florida. Now, you may not be aware of this, but Eduardo, unless you saw the movie, watched it closely, Eduardo's family had immigrated from Brazil to South Florida. They lived in Coral Gables. I know Eduardo now lives in Singapore, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but at the time, you know, he and, you know, he grew up in Coral Gables in South Florida. Think about it, right? What jury do you prefer? Wouldn't you prefer a South Florida jury, a Hispanic jury, uh, an immigrant jury, you know, a jury e that may have contacts, family, and friends with Hispanics. Remember, Eduardo is a young guy whose family is from Brazil, right? Wouldn't you prefer a South Florida jury over a California jury, right? A tech-friendly jury, you know, a jury that, you know, probably works in the tech industry, a jury that's not going to be Hispanic or predominantly immigrant is going to be, you know, uh, Northern California, you know, jury. This is what, of course, if you're, and now ask yourself the same question if you're, um, if you are Mark Zuckerberg. If you are Mark Zuckerberg, right, you definitely don't want a New York or a Florida jury, right? You would prefer a Northern California Silicon Valley jury to hear your case. You would prefer that jury because that jury is going to, first of all, know who you are. At that time, Zuckerberg, you know, was a very popular guy creating a very popular startup, providing a very popular, you know, Facebook internet service, you know, social network. And so, you know, and it's a jury that, of course, if they work at Facebook, they're going to be recused, but they very likely either work in the tech industry themselves or have family and friends that have that work in the tech industry and know what Facebook was, you know, what, a, what an asset Facebook was, at least at that time to Silicon Valley, you know, to Northern California. And so this is um, this is something that I want to say where um, I disagree with one aspect of the movie where the Winklevoss twins are portrayed. Uh, you know, they kind of say we lost the first mover advantage because Zuckerberg did get to launch the Facebook first before we got to launch the Harvard Connection. If we had gotten to launch the Harvard Connection first, Maybe we would have been more successful in what we had, you know, because students would have, once you use our service, you're not going to want to switch out and use a different service, you know. In business, to me, this is actually this is actually very much debated. Maybe you study the first mover advantage question in some of your other classes. You know, if you think about it, right, the first mover advantage, if it really were a true thing in business, right, we'd still be using Blackberries, right? Or we'd still be using, you know, uh, going to Blockbuster Video, or we'd still be, you know, whatever. You know, um, when in fact, those companies have now been replaced by second movers, you know, like Netflix and, uh, you know, iPhone respectively. Right. So but in law, I can tell you for sure there is a first mover advantage. There is a first mover advantage in civil cases because the plaintiff's attorney gets to decide in which court they're going to bring the case. Now, this is why it's so important to have a forum selection clause in the contract, because if the case is resulting from a breach of contract, then it'll have to be brought in the state and in the courthouse in which the contract, you know, if there's a forum selection clause. But if there is no forum selection clause or there is no contractual relationship, the plaintiff gets to decide in which case to bring. Uh, to bring. And this is why in real life, Mar uh, Eduardo was justifiably angry, not only because he was diluted from what was rightfully his, you know, he was promised a 30% or 35% ownership, and he's now diluted a significant, you know, degree. But also, you know, to add insult to injury, right, he served with legal papers. Um, this lawsuit is brought against him. And the reason why Zuckerberg's attorneys have to do that or decide to do that, they don't really have to do it, but they want that first mover advantage. They want to make sure that if this case does go to trial, it's going to be heard by a tech-friendly jury. You know what I mean? And not a polyglot, you know, 
uh, jury in South Florida, you know, more maybe sympathetic to somebody from South America, somebody with their background, you know what I mean, kind of thing. So uh, juries, you know, it's one of the unique aspects of our system that we have juries and lawyers try to, you know, exploit that to the best that they can, at least in civil cases, you know, where the minimum contact test gives you a lot more flexibility. Now, the reason why Zuckerberg could have been sued in Florida is because, as we'll see in our last class, uh, when Eduardo created the limited liability company for Facebook, he registered it in Florida. And Zuckerberg is listed as one of the founders. So even though, you know, even if Zuckerberg had never, you know, set foot in Florida, let's assume also that Facebook is not yet available in Florida as of 2005, you know? But the fact that he's listed on a piece of paper as owning a company that's registered in Florida will give the Florida courts minimum contacts over Mark Zuckerberg. You know what I mean? And vice versa. Could Eduardo be sued in California? Of course he could be sued in California, right? He owns shares. That's why, by the way, Eduardo's not diluted to zero. He's diluted to 0.03%, according to the movie. Why? Because but you still own a couple of shares in the Facebook the Facebook is this company located in California, right? So you can be sued in California. You own, a, you own shares of a company that has headquarters in California. Okay, so um, I just wanted to throw that out there, that there is a first mover advantage in law. And it really, even though most cases do settle out of court, you know, but by having that jury, right, that's going to give Mark Zuckerberg's attorneys a lot more, if you will, muscle when they're negotiating with Eduardo's attorneys, you know what I mean? Because now Eduardo's got to fight this case in California when he's from Coral Gables, right? Now he's got to deal with a tech-friendly jury that's going to be a lot more sympathetic to Zuckerberg and Facebook, at least back then. All right, um, let's continue with our survey and uh, begin wrapping up the class. Uh, let's go back to the screen share. And so I wanted to show you that what actually happened in real life is more dramatic than what happened in the movie because Eduardo gets justifiably angry because he served with the complaint. And by the way, what's in that complaint, among other things, among other things, Eduardo is accused of breaching his fiduciary duties to the company. This is an important aspect of the common law. Whenever you're a partner of a company or a manager of a company um, or a member of a board of the board of directors of a company, or a, a member or manager of a limited liability company. Actually, we're going to talk about this more uh, in the next class when I talk about corporate governance. But you have a duty of loyalty to that company to always act in that company's best interest. And so Eduardo, when he froze the bank account, um, Zuckerberg is going to allege that this is a breach of a fiduciary duty that you owe to my company. And by doing that, then I have the right to sue you here in California. Why is this important? Because now Eduardo is going to have to counterclaim his case against uh, Zuckerberg, he's going to have to bring it as a counterclaim in the California courts. And I've included the counterclaim in the module as well, if you want to see it for yourself. What that means is um, both under federal and state rules of civil procedure, um, whenever two parties have beef against each other, even if it's two different cases, you know, two different sets of facts, two different, you know, relationships, but if it's the two same parties, the same court, the same judge, the same jury has to decide that case as a general rule. And so it's rule one of the federal rules of civil procedure that has been copied in most of the 50 states, the rule that um, uh, where uh, uh, it's often called the judicial economy rule. You know, all the allegations that the parties have against each other have to be brought in the same case. And so this is why the plaintiff has this first mover advantage because then the plaintiff can pick a jury that's going to be the most sympathetic to his or her case and then force the other side to counterclaim. Okay, in that same court. All right, the next thing is uh, the Winklevi case, right? Um, now, as I, as I mentioned, you look at this complaint and the complaint alleges pure common law causes of action like fraud, you know, when you make a material misrepresentation of fact, you know, breach of contract, when you make a promise and that promise is supported by consideration, but then you don't live up to your promise. Um, misappropriation of trade seek when you steal someone's idea, uh, unjust enrichment, even if there is no contract, but when you benefit at the expense of another person, under certain conditions, that could be a common law quasi contract claim. And so this is why you always have to consult the lawyer, but all these are common law claims. Why is this in federal court? Because 
But actually, there's two strategic decisions in every civil case. One strategic decision, right, is what state do you bring your case in, right? What jury is going to be the best jury for your case? You know, what jury is going to be most sympathetic to you and your company? But the second strategic question is, do I go in state court or federal court? Because as you saw in this previous map, right, you have all these state courts, and then you have overlaid on top of that federal courts. And the big difference between state and federal courts as a general rule is that federal courts, um, you know, if your case does go to trial, and that's a big if because most cases get dismissed or settled out of court. But if your case goes to trial, on average, jury verdicts are larger in federal cases. Now, scholars debate why this is. Is there a self-selection bias? Are larger cases being brought in federal court versus state cases? One function of this is that state courts hear a lot of small cases, including small claims cases, you know, whereas federal courts, and we're going to see it here in this question, because in fact, in fact, a state case can be brought in federal court if two conditions are met, if the plaintiff and the defendant are from different states, and if the amount in controversy exceeds $75,000. So it's going to be C here. And it looks like most students uh, saw, read the uh, relevant chapter. Uh, I believe it was uh, the chapter on venue and jurisdiction here. Uh, the main thing is that, you know, big money cases where the parties are from different states called diversity jurisdiction can be heard in federal court. And this is going to put a lot of pressure on Mark Zuckerberg to settle this. Because think about it, right? The Winklevi, right? They're preppy. They're from, you know, that Boston Northeast area. They're really from Connecticut, but, you know, they're going to want that Boston jury is going to sympathize with them. You know, here comes this geek all the way out in California. Who is Zuckerberg? You know, probably nobody on the jury there is going to have heard of Zuckerberg, right? Unlike in California, right? And so the Winklevi, they want a Boston jury, but more than that, they want a federal court to make, you know, this is a big money case and they're more likely to get a big money award from a federal, again, on average, there's always exceptions. There are big money state cases. You know what I mean? There are smaller money federal cases, you know, but as a general rule on average, federal juries tend to award, you know, higher verdicts, you know? Um, and so, um, that's one of the advantages of going to federal court, but there's no one size fits all. There's a lot of different factors going on, you know, um, in deciding whether I go to federal court or state court. Other considerations are the docket, you know, how many cases does the federal court for Boston have versus how many cases does the local state court for Middlesex County in Cambridge, Harvard have, right? There, the tables might be turned because the federal district court for Massachusetts only have, we could go on the website, it's only going to have 10 or 12 federal district court judges hearing all the federal trial cases for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Whereas Middlesex County, right, may have four or five judges, but hearing a smaller number of cases. So there could be different, different factors at play. You know what I mean? Um, in terms of how fast the case will be decided and, you know, the possible uh, possible verdict award. And this is lawyers, judges, call this is basically the inside baseball. These are the unwritten rules. These are like, you know, um, okay, you know, where do I have a better chance of winning my case? What jury, what state? And then within a state, do I want a state jury or a federal jury? And again, that will depend on the nature of the case and the nature of this, you know, the type of, and, and the state in which the case is brought. Uh, as you can imagine, it be a lot of variety in a country where you have 50 states, you know, and each state has a courthouse for each county, you know, and then federal district courts in each state um, as well, you know, overlaid upon that. All right. Uh, our next to last question here is going to be now this is really, really important in a civil case. What is the burden of proof? Um, let's see what the class thinks here. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not beyond a reasonable doubt. That's a criminal case. State or federal right proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Civil case is different. Civil case, you're just asking for money damages. Um, sorry, uh, the proof beyond a reasonable doubt is down here. Let's go in this other order. Reasonable suspicion. It's not reasonable suspicion um, because reasonable suspicion is the standard 
um, I had a student once he said, he said, professor, you know, the house always wins, you know, um, you know, like when you try to sue the government, the police, all they need is reasonable suspicion to detain you, you know, even if, you know, uh, you, you know, there's, uh, 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 they can't arrest you, they can't search you, but they have, if they have reasonable suspicion that you have information about the commission of a crime or that you are implicated in a crime, they can detain you for quote unquote reasonable amount of time to conduct their investigation. Now, what is reasonable will depend on the nature of the crime. Like if it's murder, right? They can hold you for a long time until they investigate that, as opposed to versus it's a smaller crime, property crime, maybe. Um, but reasonable suspicion is the standard of proof that the police need just to stop you and ask you some questions. Um, now, as always, I always get this question, you know, do you have to answer the police's question? Well, technically you don't, right? Um, you know, um, but here's the thing. This is an area. You see the probable cause? Probable cause is the level of proof the police need to get a search warrant or an arrest warrant. Only if there's a search warrant or an arrest warrant do you have really the legal right to remain silent. You know, there you have a legal, technically that's where your legal right to remain silent does kick in as a federal constitutional matter. If you're just being detained, it becomes a little bit murky. It's going to depend on what state you're de detained. You know what I mean? Um, in some states, some judges have said, yeah, even if you're just detained, you know, that looks a lot like an arrest. And so you still have a right to remain silent. In other states, um, like in Florida, you know, reasonable suspicion, the courts have been more pro-police and said, look, no, reasonable suspicion, that's not an arrest. You can be detained for a reasonable uh, uh, point in time, and generally we're going to compel you to answer the police questions as long as they're relevant to whatever investigation they're doing. And the courts are going to use that reasonable standard that we saw Oliver Wendell Holmes talk about, the objective test. Um, now, on the other side, it's not going to be reasonable doubt. That's a criminal case, and it's not going to be clear and convincing evidence. It's a strong burden of proof that's generally used in cases involving punitive damages. Um, punitive damages is when you allege not only that somebody else hurt you, but you allege that they hurt you intentionally, you know, with complete disregard for your well-being. If you're alleging punitive damages, which means you can get not just the amount of damages that you suffered, but also above and beyond, the jury can give you basically, you know, 10 times as much, you know, sometimes even 100 times as much, you know. Uh, this is the McDonald's hot coffee case. The lady just wanted $10,000 for her injury. She got third degrees, third degree burns when she spilled hot coffee on herself. You know what I mean? But the jury awarded punitive damages of $7.6 million because McDonald's had had that McDonald's in Tucson, Arizona had received over 500 hot coffee complaints in the months leading up to the old lady getting burnt and completely disregarded the complaints and did nothing to warn you know, consumers about how hot the coffee was and to be careful. Um, and so, um, and the $7.6 million represented three days of sales at the national level of McDonald's, you know, uh, of selling coffee. Um, and so um, you would need clear and convincing evidence to get punitive damages. So the standard of proof in a civil case is just preponderance. You know, if I sue you for breach of contract or the Winklevoss twins sue Zuckerberg for fraud and breach of contract and stealing their idea, all they have to do is prove their case by a preponderance of the evidence. What is preponderance? It's more likely than not. That is to say, whose story does the jury believe more likely? Who is more likely telling the truth? Is it more likely that the plaintiff is telling the truth or is it more likely that the defendant is telling the truth? Here's why the preponderance standard is so important. If the jury is undecided, if the jury, you know, they're both telling the truth, you know, we can't really say um, someone is more likely than not telling the truth or more likely than not, these are the facts that occurred. If it's a tie, in other words, the defendant wins, you know, not guilty. If it's a tie, it's got to be more likely than not that the plaintiff, the person bringing the case, is telling the truth. It's a very low standard. For those of you who are football fans, maybe Tom Brady fans, maybe New England Patriot fans, you may recall about four years ago, there was the AFC championship game between the Patriots and the Colts. And the commissioner alleged uh, Tom Brady 
had, you know, tampered with the footballs, overinflated the footballs. And there was a very interesting discussion, you know, was this, is this jaywalking? You know, who cares what about the football air pressure? Or did this allegation go to the integrity of the game that the rules have to be the same for everybody? You know what I mean? Well, regardless of what you feel about the rule, about the air pressure, um, you know, uh, the NFL hired a law firm to conduct an investigation. And that law firm led by Ted Wells, a Harvard graduate who was an attorney in New York City, concluded that it was more likely than not that Tom Brady had in fact altered the footballs in violation of the NFL rule book. And so more likely than not, the preponderance, I remember what happened, I love sports. I love, you know, shows like PTI, Around the Horn, you know, uh, I love Jim Rome, you know, uh, uh, the Jim Rome show. And they were all saying, oh, this is crazy. What do you mean more likely than not? That's not definitive, but that's the standard courts use whenever it's a civil case, you know, whenever it's a civil case, unless it involves punitive damages, which is a small subset of cases, you know, um, it's going to be more likely than not or preponderance of the evidence. Now, the larger point I want to make with, with burden of proof is that this is part of due process. And I'm going to um, end the screen share momentarily before we conclude to emphasize this point. Um, due process is, and I said this at the beginning, the party who makes the accusation has the burden of proving their case. If it's a criminal case, the burden is very high. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You may have heard, you know, there's a presumption of innocence in a criminal case, right? We have to presume, or the legal system has to presume the defendant is innocent. That presumption is a product of the burden of proof being imposed on the prosecution and the prosecution having a high burden. In a civil case, the burden likewise is on the plaintiff, on the party making the allegations that you stole my idea, that you broke your promises, that you committed fraud and lied to me, for example, like the Winklevoss they have the burden of proof of proving their case. Now there, the burden is much lower. It's going to be preponderance of the evidence or more likely than not. But the point is that they, the plaintiff, have the plaintiffs have the burden of proof. Now, this is part of a larger aspect of uh, the law called due process. And due process means basically it's a legal form for fairness. It means the defendant has to be treated with respect, and the burden is always on the party making the allegation. Go back to this chart that I have in this survey question. Um, and now go back to your, uh, uh, like, you know, maybe you've had debates with your friends, you know, does God exist? Is abortion immoral? Um, should, you know, Trump be elected, or should DeSantis be elected, or should Joe Biden be reelected, or should Robert Kennedy Jr., or whatever, you know, you know, maybe you've had debates about politics, about the law, about morality, about religion. Think about what people rarely um, agree to before they debate is what are the rules of the debate? Who has the, per the burden of proving their case, proving their argument, and what is that burden? That's due process. Due process is whoever makes an allegation against someone, they have the burden of proof. And the burden will vary depending on whether the allegations are criminal in nature, like the Trump case, or civil in nature, like the Eduardo case or the Winklevi case, you know? So that's a really big accomplishment of the Anglo-American law, due process. And let me, let me tell you something about due process. Even the so-called Nuremberg Court, the Nazi war criminals, when they were put on trial for genocide in October 1946, by the allies, they were given due process. The burden was on the, you know, the prosecution to prove that war crimes were committed and, and the defendants had the right to their uh, uh, attorney and to cross-examine the evidence against them. So I just want to tell you that due process is three things, burden of proof on the moving party, uh, fair and impartial judge, and finally, the defendant has the right to present their defense, to present their arguments, and to challenge the uh, evidence against them, and to introduce their own evidence. That is due process. And this, to me, is what's going to separate the Donald Trump case from, remember I talked about at the beginning of this class, Charles I, you know, 10-day trial, and he's executed. Um, Louis XVI of France, one-day trial, same-day execution. 
Alexander the second, you know, in Russia, 1917, Bolsheviks don't even bother to put him on trial. You know, Trump will get a right to trial and, you know, um, he'll have the right to due process. He'll have a right uh, to, you know, bring his own evidence and to challenge the evidence against him. You know, um, that's what due process is about. It's about regardless of the outcome, you are treated fairly, you know, whether you're Donald Trump, whether you're a Nazi war criminal, whether you're, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Edward, you know, whoever you are, you get to be treated fairly. And that to me, I'm going to tell you, if you remember one thing from this class, it is due process. Now, I have to say, uh, before we conclude here, um, I have one last survey question. And this last survey question is alternate dispute resolution, you know, like uh, mediation and um, arbitration. Um, arbitration especially is quite controversial because, you know, the due process and mediation, you know, it's it's not there. But what's kind of ironic is, and this is the story of the of the movie, the Zapruder film, very famous movie, most famous home movie of all time. You know, um, after the government, after the movie, after Oliver Stone um, released his movie motion picture called JFK, public was outraged. Why is this movie not available to the public. It's a home movie. This this actually is the most solid piece of evidence. Whether you agree with the lone gunman theory that L Lee Harvey Oswald was acting alone, or whether you agree, uh, you know, with the conspiracy theories that maybe there was more than one person involved in all this, you know. And so, um, um, so the government approved this law uh, as part of. I'm sorry, the Congress approved this law as part of the outcry uh, the movie generated. President H. W. Bush. Uh, signed the bill into law in October 1992. And the law, among other things, authorized the government, the National Archives, to buy the rights to the film and then put the film in the public domain. Um, at the time, because this was a home movie, it was owned by the family of the guy who took the movie. Now, the guy who took the movie was dead, but it was his intellectual property. So the family owned the rights to the movie. And what's interesting is the family wanted $50 million. The family said, look, this is like a rare Leonardo da Vinci painting. Only 12 Leonardo da Vinci paintings in the world. You know what I mean? The last time a Leonardo da Vinci painting was put on sale at Sotheby's in London, it went back then for $38, $37 million. So we want $50 million because this is a one-of-a-kind, you know, most famous artifact, perhaps in all of American history, perhaps second only to the Declaration of Independence, right? And um, the government was only wanted to pay $1 million. You know, we'll pay you, but we're not going to pay you $1 million, you know what I'm saying? And this is very controversial at the time, you know what I mean? How do you assign a value to something that is priceless, that doesn't, there's no market for home movies showing assassination of world leaders, you know what I mean? So how do you, you know, how do you value something like that? You know, for many, and this is a fascinating economic question. Um, and so, interestingly enough, the parties in this case agreed to arbitration. Not even the government wanted a jury trial, and not even the family wanted a jury trial either. And so, I want to end on this note: um, the two main forms of alternate dispute resolution are going to be mediation, where the judge compels the parties to mediate their dispute, or arbitration. Now, the main difference between mediation and arbitration, there's two important differences, really three important differences. One difference is that mediation, though you have to go, if the judge orders it, you have to go to the mediation session. Um, mediation is completely non-binding. You know, if the parties are unable to agree to a mediated settlement, um, the case then has to go to trial. Generally, the judge will order mediation after discovery but before the case goes to trial or towards the end of the discovery process, at least one mediation session. But mediation is non-binding. Arbitration, however, the big difference is a judge cannot order arbitration. Arbitration is like a private court. The parties have to agree to arbitration in a contract, either because the contract has an arbitration clause or like in the case involving the Zapruder film, you know, you agree with the other side, let's go to arbitration, let's avoid the jury altogether. Now, um, arbitration, generally speaking, the contract will determine whether it's binding or not. But, you know, um, I've never seen a non-binding arbitration clause. You know, arbitration is usually a binding deal. And what that means is 
you can't appeal, you know, you under except under very rare limited circumstances where you can prove that there was fraud by the arbitration panel or corruption by the arbitrator or the arbitration panel. Very difficult to prove that, you know. Um, and so um, the other main difference is while mediation is voluntary, you know, you go to the session, you talk to the mediator, the mediator then here's the other side in a separate room. What the mediator tries to do is bring both sides together. And in fact, the Winklevoss case against Mark Zuckerberg, that was resolved via mediation. Eduardo's case, or the case between Eduardo and Zuckerberg, because really Zuckerberg brought the case first to get the Northern California jury, that was ultimately resolved by mediation. Even Joe Exotic and Carol Baskin, you know, Probably two people who don't, you know, I can't think of two other people who really despise each other more than Carol Baskin and Joe Exotic. Even they resolved their Tiger King trademark and copyright cases via mediation. So mediation has a lot, you know, it's voluntary. You try to bring the sides together and you avoid the risk of going to trial. Arbitration, what you do is you go, you avoid trial altogether. Now, why would parties ever want to mediate or even arbitrate their disputes? Arbitration is a little bit more controversial, I'm going to tell you, because you give up your right to a jury trial. But if you think about it, you do the same thing with mediation, because by agreeing to the mediated settlement, there's no need for the jury trial. And I'm going to tell you right now, the reason why it's called ADR or alternate dispute resolution, whether it's by arbitration, because there's a clause in the contract, between the parties that allows, authorizes binding arbitration, or whether it's the judge who compels a mediation session and the parties realize it's in their best interest to mediate. The reason why ADR is becoming more and more popular is because jury trials, civil jury trials especially, there's two big variables. One is the cost. It's expensive to have your day in court because discovery, think of that movie, The Social Network, all the deposition testimony that was taken, all, all the court reporters that were there, you know, all the videographer, the video camera guy that was there also, you know, that's it. the lawyers and the multiple lawyers, all, you know, in a civil case, probably going on an hourly fee, you know, uh, uh, civil litigation is very expensive, but number two, also highly uncertain, right? The jury is really the bulwark of our liberties. The jury is the most, if you will, genius aspect of the Anglo-American legal environment. But at the same time, there's a lot of uncertainty. How will the jury decide the case? Like the Trump, even if it's in Miami, your guess is as good as mine. I'm an attorney with four, law professor with 40 years experience. I went to Yale Law School. I read all these books. And your guess is as good as mine as to what's going to happen to the Trump case if it ever goes to a jury. A jury is highly uncertain, right? It's a black box. Uh, we don't know what goes on in the deliberation because the deliberations are secret. And so, um, um, uh, you know, it's, so the jury is interesting, right? Is it a bug or is it a feature? You know, parties that are risk averse tend to prefer to mediate their disputes to avoid going to the jury or, you know, arbitrate their disputes to avoid uh, also the expense of going to a jury because with arbitration, generally, there's no discovery. It's a much more truncated discovery phase, you know? Uh, uh, and so um, there are pros and cons of both. Now with the jury, right? You get your right to your day in court. And if it's a federal jury to a possible large verdict, right? So it's like, um, you know, um, when you sign an arbitration clause, right? Uh, you're giving up that right to a jury trial, but you're going to get a faster outcome, you know, but probably lesser amount of money. Let me just end by saying in the Zapruder case, it went to arbitration. The arbitration panel ultimately awarded $17 million to the Zapruder family for the rights to that movie. So the government had to end up paying $17 million for the rights to the movie. Um, the original now Zapruder film is in the National Archives under the care, you know, of those experts. Um, but I believe the government has um, transferred the copyright, the right to exhibit the movie to some uh, an entity called the Sixth Floor Museum in Dallas, Texas. Um, and they have posted it on YouTube. So if you want to see the Zapruder film for yourself, you can now, it's now accessible to the public. Something that was not the case before the movie JFK. And then you can decide for yourself whether you believe the government's theory or the conspiracy theory about the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. All right, with that, we're going to conclude this class. Quick preview, our last class will be next week 
I'll try to reconfigure my schedule so we can do one last live Zoom. Um, I will probably still be overseas, uh, overseas, so it'll have to be a Zoom, but I'll continue to post the recording as we've been doing. In that last class, I want to talk about corporate governance, the different ways of doing business. But more importantly, I've noticed from previous surveys, students are very aware of the different forms of doing business. I'm going to focus on business ethics and corporate governance. You know, Does a company, regardless of whether they're a corporation or a limited liability company or a partnership, does a company have ethical obligations to society? And if so, what are what is the content of those ethical obligations? So we'll, we'll end the course on that note by looking at ethics, and uh, then we'll conclude our semester. All right. With that, um, this class is now over. I may have gone a little bit over time. I apologize for that. Um, good evening to all. Hope to see everybody next week.